as I read this chapter for you, I would request all of you to please follow your textbooks and try to read along. It will make your reading and learning easier. So let's start. This is chapter 2, Nationalism in India. As you have seen, modern nationalism in Europe came to be associated with the formation of nation states. It also meant a change in people's understanding of who they were and what defined their identity and sense of belonging. New symbols and icons, new songs and ideas are forged, new links and re redefine the boundaries of communities. In most countries, the making of this new national identity was a long process. How did this consciousness emerge in India? In India, as in many other colonies, the growth of modern nationalism is intimately connected to the anti-colonial movement. People began discovering their unity in the process of their struggle with colonialism. The sense of being oppressed under a colonialism provided a shared bond that tied many different groups together. But each class and group felt the effects of colonialism differently. Their experiences were varied and their notions of freedom were not always the same. The Congress under Mahatma Gandhi tried to forge these groups together within one movement. But the unity did not emerge without conflict. In an earlier textbook, you have read about the growth of nationalism in India up to the first decade of 20th century. In this chapter, we will pick up the story from the 1920s and study the non-cooperation and civil disobedience movement. We will explore how the Congress sought to develop the national movement, how different social groups participated in the movement and how nationalism captured the imagination of people. The First World War, Khilafat and Non-Cooperation In the years after 1919, we see the national movement spreading to new areas, incorporating new social groups and developing new modes of struggle. How do we understand these developments? What implications did they have? First of all, the war created a new economic and political situation. It led to a huge increase in defense expenditure which was financed by war loans and increasing taxes. Custom duties were raised and income tax introduced. Through the war years, prices increased, doubling between 1913 and 1918, leading to extreme hardship for the common people. Villages were called up to supply soldiers and the forced recruitment in rural areas caused widespread anger. Then in 1918-19 and 1920-21, crops failed in many parts of India, resulting in acute shortage of food. This was accompanied by an influenza epidemic. According to the census of 1921, 12 and 13 million people perished as a result of famines and epidemic. New words, forced recruitment, a process by which the colonial state forced people to join the army. People hoped that their hardship would end after the war was over, but that did not happen. At this stage, a new leader appeared and suggested a new mode of struggle. The idea of Satyagraha. Mahatma Gandhi returned to India in January 1915. As you know, he had come from South Africa, where he had successfully fought the racist regime with a novel method of mass agitation, which he called Satyagraha. The idea of Satyagraha emphasized the power of truth and the need to search for truth. It suggested that if the cause was true, if the struggle was against injustice, then physical force was not necessary to fight the oppressor. Without seeking vengeance or being aggressive, a Satyagrahi could win the battle through non-violence. This could be done by appealing to the conscience of oppressor. People, including the oppressors, had to be persuaded to see the truth, instead of being forced to accept truth through the views of violence. By this struggle, truth was bound to ultimately triumph. Mahatma Gandhi believed that this dharma of non-violence could unite all Indians. After arriving in India, Mahatma Gandhi successfully organized Satyagraha movements in various places. In 1917, he traveled to Champaran in Bihar to inspire the peasants to struggle against the oppressive plantation system. Then in 1917, he organized a Satyagraha to support the peasants of Kheda district of Gujarat. Affected by crop failure, 
a plague epidemic, the peasants of Kheda could not pay the revenue and were demanding that revenue collection be relaxed. In 1918, Mahatma Gandhi went to Ahmedabad to organize a Satyagraha movement amongst cotton mill workers. The Rollet Act Emboldened with this success, Gandhiji in 1919 decided to launch a nationwide Satyagraha against the proposed Rollet Act in 1919. This act had been hurriedly passed through the Imperial Legislative Council despite the united opposition of Indian members. It gave the government enormous power to repress political activities and allowed detention of political prisoners without trial for two years. Mahatma Gandhi wanted non-violent civil disobedience against such unjust law, which would start with the Hartal on 6 April. Rallies were organized in various cities, workers went on strike in railway workshops and shops closed down. Alarmed by the popular upsurge and scared that lines of communication such as railways and telegraph would be disrupted, the British administration decided to clamp down on nationalists. Local leaders were picked up from Amritsar and Mahatma Gandhi was barred from entering Delhi. On 10th April, the police in Amritsar fired upon a peaceful procession provoking widespread attacks on banks, post offices and railway stations. Martial law was imposed and General Dyer took command. On 13th April, the infamous Jallianwala Bagh incident took place. On that day, a large crowd gathered in enclosed ground of Jallianwala Bagh. Some came to the protest against the government's new repressive measures. Others had come to attend the annual Baisakhi Fair. Being from outside the city, many villagers were unaware of the martial law that had been imposed. Dyer entered the area, blocked the exit points and opened fire on the crowd, killing hundreds. This object, as he declared later, was to produce a moral effect to create in the minds of Satyagrahis a feeling of terror and awe. As the new of news of Jallianwala Bagh spread, crowds took to the streets in many North Indian towns. There were strikes, clashes with the police and attacks on government buildings. The government responded with a brutal repression. Seeking to humiliate and terrorize people, Satyagrahis were forced to rub their nose on the ground, crawl on the streets and do salam. To all sahibs, people were flogged and villages around Gurjanwala in Punjab, now in Pakistan, were bombed. Seeing violence spread, Mahatma Gandhi called off the movement. While the Rollet Satyagraha had been a widespread movement, it was still limited mostly to cities and towns. Mahatma Gandhi now felt the need to launch a more broad-based movement in India, but he was certain that no such movement could be organized without bringing the Hindus and Muslims closer together. On way of doing this, he felt was to take up Khilafat issue. The First World War had ended with the defeat of Ottoman Turkey and there were rumours that a harsh peace treaty was going to be imposed on the Ottoman Emperor. The spiritual head of the Islamic world, the Khalifa, to defend the Khalifa's temporal powers, a Khilafat committee was formed in Bombay in March 1919. A young generation of Muslim leaders like the brothers Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali began discussing with Mahatma Gandhi about the possibility of a united mass action on the issue. Gandhiji saw this as an opportunity to bring Muslims under the umbrella of a unified national movement. At the Calcutta session of the Congress in September 1920, he convinced other leaders of the need to start a non-cooperation movement in support of Khilafat as well as for Swaraj. Why non-cooperation? In his famous book, Hind Swaraj, 1909, Mahatma Gandhi declared that British rule was established in India with the cooperation of Indians and had survived only because of this cooperation. If, if Indians refused to cooperate, British rule in India would collapse within a year and Swaraj would come. How could non-cooperation become a movement? Gandhiji proposed that the movement should be unfold in stages. It should begin with the surrender of titles that the government awarded and a boycott of civil services, army, police, courts and legislative councils, schools and foreign goods. Then, in case the government used repression, a full civil dis mobilizing popular support for the movement. New words here, boycott. 
the refusal to deal and associate with people or participate in activities or buy and use things usually a form of protest many within the congress were however concerned about the proposals they were reluctant to boycott the council elections scheduled for november 1920 and they feared that the movement might lead to popular violence in the months between september and december there was an intense tussle with the congress for a while there seemed no meeting point between the supporters and the opponents of the movement finally at the congress session at nagpur in december 1920 a compromise was worked out and the non cooperation program was adopted how did the movement unfold who participated in it how did different social groups conceive the idea of non cooperation differing strands within the movement the non cooperation khilafat movement began in january 1921 various social groups participated in this movement each with its own specific aspirations all of them responded to the call of swaraj but the term meant different things to different people the movement in the towns the movement started with the middle class participation in the cities thousands of students left government controlled schools and colleges headmasters and teachers resigned and lawyers gave up their legal practices the council elections were boycotted in most provinces except madras where the justice party the party of the non brahmans felt that entering the council was one way of gaining some power something that usually one brahmans had access to the effects of non cooperation on the economic front were more dramatic foreign goods were boycotted liquor shops picketed and foreign cloth burned in huge bonfires the import of foreign cloth halved between 1921 and 22 its value dropping from rupees 102 crores to rupees 57 crore in many places merchants and traders refused to trade in foreign goods or finance foreign trade as the boycott movement spread the people began discarding imported clothes and wearing only indian ones production of indian textile mills and handlooms went up new words picket a form of demonstration or protest by which people block the entrance to a shop factory or office but this movement in the cities gradually slowed down for a variety of reasons khadi cloth was often more expensive than mass produced milk cloth and poor people could not afford to buy it how then could they boycott milk cloth for too long similarly the boycott of british institution posed a problem for the movement to be successful alternative indian institutions had to be set up so that they could be used in place of british ones these were slow to come up so students and teachers began trickling back to government schools and lawyers joined back work in government courts rebellion in countryside from the cities the non cooperation movement spread to the countryside it drew into its fold the struggles of peasants and tribals which were developing in different parts of india in the years after the war in avadh peasants were led by baba ram chandra a sanyasi who had earlier been to fiji as an indentured laborer the movement here was against talukdars and landlord who demanded from the peasants exorbitant high rents and a variety of other excesses peasants had to do beggar and work at landlords farms without any payment as tenants they had no security of tenure being regularly evicted so that they could acquire no right over the leased land the peasants movement demanded reduction of revenue abolition of beggar and social boycott of oppressive landlords in many places nai dhobi bands were organized by panchayats to deprive landlords of the services of even barbers and washermen In June 1920 Jawaharlal by October the Aud Kisan Sabha was set up headed by Jawaharlal Nehru Baba Ram Chandra and a few others within a month over 300 branches had been set up in villages around the region so when the non cooperation movement began the following year the effort of the congress was to integrate the avadh peasant struggle into the wider struggle the peasant movement however developed in forms that the congress leadership was unhappy with as the movement spread in 1921 the houses of talukdars and merchants were attacked bazaars were looted and grain hordes were taken over 
In many places, local leaders told peasants that Gandhiji had declared that no taxes were to be paid and land had to be redistributed among the poor. The name of the Mahatma was being invoked to sanction all action and aspirations. Tribal peasants interpreted the message of Mahatma Gandhi and the idea of Swaraj in yet another way. In the Gudim Hills of Andhra Pradesh, for instance, a militant guerrilla movement spread in early 1920s, not a form of struggle that Congress could approve. Here, as in other forest regions, the colonial government had closed large forest areas, preventing people from entering the forest to gaze their cattle, collect fuel wood and fruits. This enraged the hill people. Not only were their livelihoods affected, but they felt that their traditional rights were being denied. When the government began forcing them to contribute beggar for road building, the hill people revolted. The person who came to lead them was an interesting figure. Aluri Sitaram Raju claimed that he had a variety of special powers. He could make correct astrological predictions and heal people. And he could survive even bullet shots. Captivated by Raju, the rebels proclaimed that he was an incarnation of God. Raju talked of the greatness of Mahatma Gandhi and said he was inspired by the non-cooperation movement and persuaded people to wear khadi and give up drinking. But at the same time, he asserted that India could be liberated only by the use of force, not non-violence. The Gudim rebels attacked police stations, attempted to kill British officials and carried on guerrilla warfare for achieving Swaraj. Raju was captured and executed in 1924 and over time became a folk hero. Swaraj in the plantations, workers too had their own understanding of Mahatma Gandhi. The notion of Swaraj for plantation workers in Assam, freedom meant the right to move freely in and out of the confined space in which they were enclosed. And it meant retaining a link with the village from which they had come. Under the Inland Immigration Act of 1859, plantation workers were not permitted to leave the tea gardens without permission and in fact, they were rarely given such permissions. When they heard of non-cooperation movement, thousands of workers defied the authorities, left the plantation and headed home. They believed that Gandhi Raj was coming and everyone would be given land in their own villages. They, however, never reached their destinations. Stranded on the way by railway and steamer strike, they were caught by the police and brutally beaten up. The visions of these movements were not defined by Congress program. They interpreted the term Swaraj in their own ways, imagining it to be a time when all suffering and all troubles would be over. Yet, when the tribals chanted Gandhiji's name and raised slogans demanding Swatantra Bharat, they were also emotionally relating to an All India Agitation. When they acted in the name of Mahatma Gandhi or linked their movement to that of Congress, they were identifying with a movement which went beyond the limits of their immediate locality. Towards Civil Disobedience In February 1922, Mahatma Gandhi decided to withdraw the non-cooperation movement. He felt the movement was turning violent in many places and Satyagrahis needed to be properly trained before they would be ready for mass struggles. Within the Congress, some leaders were by now tired of mass struggles and wanted to participate in elections to the provincial councils that had been set up by the Government of India Act of 1919. They felt that it was important to oppose British policies within the councils, argue for reform and also demonstrate that these councils were not truly democratic. C.R. Das and Motilal Nehru formed the Swaraj Party within the Congress to argue for the return to council politics, but younger leaders like Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose pressed for more radical mass agitation and for full independence. In such a situation of internal debate and dissensions, two factors again shaped Indian politics towards the late 1920s. The first was the effect of the worldwide economic depression. Agricultural prices began to fall from 1926 and collapsed after 1930. As the demand for agricultural goods fell and exports declined, peasants found it difficult to sell their harvest and pay their revenue. By 1930, the countryside was in turmoil. Against this background, the new Tory government in Britain constituted a statutory commission under Sir John Simon. 
set up in response to nationalist movement the commission was to look into the functioning of the constitutional system in india and suggest changes the problem was that the commission did not have a single indian member they were all british when the simon commission arrived in india in 1928 it was greeted with the slogan go back simon all parties including the congress and the muslim league participated in the demonstrations in an effort to win them over the viceroy lord irwin announced in october 1929 a vague offer of dominion status for india in an unspecified future and a round table conference to discuss a future constitution this does not satisfy the congress leaders the radicals within the congress led by jawaharlal nehru and subhash chandra bose became more assertive the liberals and moderates who were proposing a constitutional system within the framework of british dominion gradually lost their influence in december 1929 under the presidency of jawaharlal nehru the lahore congress formalized the demand of poorn swaraj or full independence for india it was declared that 26 january 1930 would be celebrated as the independence day when people were to take a pledge to struggle for complete independence but the celebrations attracted very little attention so mahatma gandhi had to find a way to relate this abstract idea of freedom to more concrete issues of everyday life the salt march and the civil disobedience movement mahatma gandhi found in salt a powerful symbol that could unite the nation on 31st january 1930 he sent a letter to viceroy irwin stating 11 demands some of these were of general interest others were specific demands of different classes from industrialists to peasants the idea was to make the demands wide ranging so that all classes within indian society could identify with them and everyone could be brought together in a united campaign the most stirring of all was the demand to abolish the salt tax salt was something consumed by the rich and the poor alike and it was one of the most essential items of food the tax on salt and the government monopoly over its production mahatma gandhi declared revealed the most oppressive face of british rule mahatma gandhi's letter was in a way an ultimatum if the demands were not fulfilled by 11 march the letter stated the congress would launch a civil disobedience campaign irwin was unwilling to negotiate so mahatma gandhi started his famous salt march accompanied by 78 of his trusted volunteers the march was over 20, 240 miles from gandhi ji's ashram in sabarmati to the gujarati coastal town in of dandi the volunteers walked for 24 days about 10 miles a day thousands came to hear mahatma gandhi wherever he stopped and he told them what he meant by swaraj and urged them to peacefully defy the british on 6th april he reached dandi and ceremonially violated the law manufacturing salt by boiling sea water this marked the beginning of civil disobedience movement how was this movement different from non cooperation movement people were now asked not only to refuse cooperation with the british as they had done in 1921 22 but also to break colonial laws thousands in different parts of the country broke the salt law manufactured salt and demonstrated in front of government salt factories as the movement spread foreign cloth was boycotted and liquor shops were picketed peasants refused to pay revenue and chokidari uh, taxes village officials resigned and in many places forest people violated forest laws going into reserved forest to collect wood and graze cattle worried by the developments the colonial government began arresting the congress leaders one by one they led to violent clashes in many places when abdul gafar khan a devout disciple of mahatma gandhi was arrested in april 1930 angry crowds demonstrated in the streets of peshawar facing armored cars and police firing many were killed a month later when mahatma gandhi himself was arrested industrial workers in sholapur attacked police posts municipal buildings law courts and railway stations all structures that symbolized british rule a frightened government responded with a policy of brutal repression peaceful satyagrahis were attacked women and children were beaten and about 1 lakh people were arrested in such a situation mahatma gandhi once again decided to call up the movement and entered into a pact with irwin on 5th march 1931 
By this, Gandhi is in fact Gandhi ji consented to participate in a round table conference. The Congress had boycotted the first round table conference in London, and the government agreed to release the political prisoners. In December 1931, Gandhi ji went to London for the conference, but the negotiations broke down, and he returned disappointed. Back in India, he discovered that the government had begun a new cycle of repression. Gafar Khan and Jawaharlal Nehru were both in jail. The Congress had been declared illegal, and a series of measures had been imposed to prevent meetings, demonstrations, and boycotts. With great apprehension, Mahatma Gandhi relaunched the civil disobedience movement. For a over for over a year, the movement continued, but by 1934, it lost its momentum. How participants saw the movement? Let us now look at the different social groups that participated in the civil disobedience movement. Why did they? Join the movement. What were their ideals? What did Swaraj mean to them? In the countryside, rich pe peasants, communities like the Patidars of Gujarat and the Jats of Uttar Pradesh, were active in the movement. Being producers of commercial crops, they were very hard hit by the trade depression and falling prices. As their cash income disappeared, they found it impossible to pay the government's revenue demand. and the refusal of the government to reduce the revenue demand led to widespread resentment these rich peasants became enthusiastic supporters of the civil disobedience movement organizing their communities and at times forcing reluctant members to participate in the boycott programs for them the fight for swaraj was a struggle against high revenues but they were deeply disappointed when the movement was called off in 1931 without the revenue rates being revised So when the movement was restarted in 1932 many of them refused to participate the poorer peasantry were not just interested in the lowering of revenue demand many of them were small tenants cultivating land they had rented from landlords as the depression continued and the cash incomes dwindled the small tenants found it difficult to pay their rent they wanted the unpaid rent to the landlord to be remitted they joined a variety of radical movements often led by socialists and communists apprehensive of raising issues that might upset the rich peasants and landlords the congress was unwilling to support no rent campaigns in most places so the relationship between the poor peasants and the congress remained uncertain what about the business classes how did they relate to the civil disobedience movement during the first world war indian merchants and industrialists had made huge profits and became powerful Keen on expanding their business, they now reacted against colonial policies that restricted business activities. They wanted protection against imports of foreign goods and a rupee sterling foreign exchange ratio that would discourage imports. To organize business interests, they formed the Indian Industrial and Commercial Congress in 1920 and the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries that is FICCI in 1927. led by prominent industrialists like Purushottam Das, Thakur Das and G D Birla the industrialists attacked colonial control over the Indian economy and supported the civil disobedience movement when it was first launched they gave financial assistance and refused to buy or sell imported goods most businessmen came to see swaraj as a time when colonial restrictions on business would no longer exist and trade and industry would flourish without constraints but after the failure of the round table conference business groups were no longer uniformly enthusiastic they were apprehensive of the spread of militant activities and worried about prolonged disruption of business as well as of growing influence of socialism amongst the younger members of the congress the industrial working classes did not participate in the civil disobedience movement in large numbers except the nagpur region as the industrialists came closer to the congress workers stayed aloof but in spite of that some workers did participate in civil disobedience movement selectively adopting some of the ideas of gandhian program like boycott of foreign goods as part of their own movement against low wages and poor working conditions there were strikes by railway workers in 1930 and dock workers in 1932 in 1930 thousands of workers in chhota nagpur 10 minute mines wore gandhi caps and participated in protest rallies and boycott campaigns but the congress was reluctant to include workers demands as part of its program of struggle it felt that this would alienate industries industrialists and divide the anti imperial forces there some important dates on this uh, page 
1918-19, distressed UP peasants organized by Baba Ram Chandra. April 1919, Gandhian Hartal against Rowlett Act, Jallianwala Bag massacre. January 1921, non-cooperation and Khilafat movement launched. February 1922, Chauri Chaura Gandhi ji withdraws non-cooperation movement. May 1924. Aluri Sitaram Raju arrested ending a two year armed tri- tribal struggle December 1929 Lahore Congress Congress adopts the demand for Poon Swaraj 1930 Ambedkar establishes depressed classes association March 1930 Gandhi ji begins civil disobedience movement by breaking salt law at Dandi March 31 Gandhi ji ends civil disobedience movement December 1931 second round table conference 1932 civil disobedience relaunched Another important feature of civil disobedience movement was the large scale participation of women during Gandhi ji's salt march thousands of women came out of their homes to listen to him they participated in protest marches manufactured salt and picketed foreign cloth and liquor shops many went to jail in urban areas these women were from high caste families in rural areas they came from rich peasant households moved by gandhi ji's call they began to see service to the nation as a sacred duty of women yet this increased public role did not necessarily mean any radical changes in the way the position of women were visualized gandhi ji was convinced that it was the duty of women to look after home and hearth be good mothers and good wives and for a long time congress was reluctant to allow women to hold any position of authority within the organization it was keen only on their symbolic presence the limits of civil disobedience not all social groups were moved by the abstract concept of swaraj one such group was the nation's untouchables who from around 1930s had begun to call themselves dalit or oppressed for long the congress had ignored the dalits for fear of offending the sanatanis the conservative high caste hindus but mahatma gandhi declared that swaraj would not come for a hundred years if untouchability was not eliminated he called the untouchables harijan or the children of god organized satyagraha to secure them entry into temples and access to public wells tanks roads and schools he himself cleaned toilets to dignify the workers of bhangi and persuaded upper caste to change their heart and give up the sin of untouchability but many dalit leaders were keen on different political solutions to the problem of the community they began organizing themselves demanding reserved seats in educational institution and separate electorate that would choose dalit members for legislative councils political empowerment they believed would resolve the problems of their social disabilities Dalit participation in the civil disobedience movement was therefore limited particularly in Maharashtra and Nagpur region where their organization was quite strong Dr B R Ambedkar who organized the Dalits into press classes association in 1930 clashed with Mahatma Gandhi at the second round table conference by demanding separate electorates for Dalits when the British government conceded Ambedkar's demand Gandhi ji began a fast unto death he believed that separate electorates for dalits would slow down the process of their integration into the society ambedkar ultimately accepted gandhi ji's position and the result was the pune pact of september 1932 it gave the depressed classes reserved seats in provincial and central legislative councils but they were to be voted in by the general electorate the dalit movement however continued to be a prehensive of congress led national movement Some of the Muslim political organization in India were also lukewarm in their response to the civil disobedience movement. After the decline of the non-cooperation Khilafat movement, a large section of Muslims felt alienated from Congress. From the mid 1920s, the Congress came to be more visibly associated with the openly Hindu religious nationalist groups like the Hindu Mahasabha. as relations between hindus and muslim worsened each community organized religious processions with militant fervor provoking hindu muslim communal clashes communal clashes and riots in various cities every riot deepened the distance between the two communities the congress and the muslim league made efforts to renegotiate an alliance in 9 and in 1927 it appeared that such a unity could be forged the important difference over the question of representation in future assemblies that were to be elected 
Muhammad Ali Jinnah, one of the leaders of the Muslim League, was willing to give up the demand for separate electorates if Muslims were assured reserved seats in the Central Assembly and representation in proportion to the population in Muslim-dominated provinces, which was Bengal and Punjab. Negotiations over the question of representation continued, but all hope of resolving the issue at the All Parties Conference in 1928 disappeared when M. R. Jaikar of Hindu Mahasabha strongly opposed efforts at compromise. When civil disobedience movement started, there was thus an atmosphere of suspicion and distrust between communities. Alienated from Congress, large sections of Muslims could not respond to the call for a united struggle. Many Muslims, leaders and intellectuals expressed their concern about the status of Muslims and as a minority within India. They feared that the culture and identity of minorities would be submerged under domination of a Hindu majority. I request all of you to please go through all the sources given in the textbook belonging. Nationalism spread when people begin to believe that they are all part of the same nation, when they discover some unity that binds them together. But how did the nation become a reality in the minds of people? How did the people belonging to different communities, regions or language groups develop a sense of collective belonging? This sense of collective belonging came partly through the experience of united struggles, but there were also a variety of cultural processes through which nationalism ca captured people's imagination. History and fiction, folklore and songs, popular prints and symbols all played a part in making of nationalism. The identity of a nation, as you know, is is most often symbolized in a figure or image. This helps create an image with which people can identify the nation. It was in the 20th century with the growth of nationalism that the identity of India came to be visually associated with the image of Bharat Mata. The image was first created by Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay. In the 1870s, he wrote Vande Matram as a hymn to the motherland. Later, it was included in his novel Anand Mat and widely sung during the Swadeshi movement in Bengal. Moved by the Swadeshi movement, Abhanindranath Tagore painted his famous image of Bharat Mata. In this painting, Bharat Mata is portrayed as an ascetic figure. She is calm, composed, divine and spiritual. In subsequent years, the image of Bharat Mata acquired many different forms as it circulated in popular prints and was painted by different artists. Devotion to this mother figure came to be seen as evidence of one's nationalism. Ideas of nationalism also developed through the movement to revive Indian folklore. In late 19th century India, nationalists began recording folk tales sung by the bards and they toured villages to gather folk songs and legends. These tales, they believed, gave a true picture of traditional culture that had been corrupted and damaged by outside forces. It was essential to preserve this folk tradition in order to discover one's national identity and restore a sense of pride in one's past. In Bengal, Rabindranath Tagore himself began collecting ballads, nursery rhymes and myths and let, led the movement for folk revival. In Madras, Natesa Sastri published a massive four-volume collection of Tamil folk tales, the folklore of South Southern India. He believed that folklore was national literature. It was the most trustworthy manifestation of people's real thoughts and characteristics. As the national movement developed, nationalist leaders became more and more aware of such icons and symbols in unifying people and inspiring in them a feeling of nationalism. During the Swadeshi movement in Bengal, a tricolor flag was designed. It was eight lotuses representing eight provinces of British India and a crescent moon representing Hindus and Muslims. By 1921, Gandhiji had designed the Swaraj flag. It was again a tricolor, red, green and white, and had a spinning wheel in the center representing the Gandhian ideal of self-help. Carrying the flag, holding it aloft during marches became a symbol of defiance. Another means of creating a feeling of nationalism was through reinterpretation of history. By the end of the 19th century, many Indians began feeling that to instill a sense of pride in the nation, Indian history had to be thought 
about differently. The British saw Indians as a backward and primitive, incapable of governing themselves. In response, Indians began looking into past to discover India's great achievements. They wrote about the glorious development in ancient times when art and architecture, science and mathematics, region, religion and culture, law and philosophy, crafts and trade had flourished. This glorious time, in their view, was followed by a history of decline when India was colonized. These nationalist histories urged the readers to take pride in India's great achievement in the past and struggle to change the miserable conditions of life under British rule. These efforts to unify people were not without problems. When the past being glorified was Hindu, when the images celebrated were drawn from Hindu iconography, then people of other communities felt left out. Conclusion A growing anger against the colonial government was thus bringing together various groups and classes of Indians into a common struggle for freedom in the first half of the 20th century. The Congress, under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, tried to channel people's grievances into organized movements for independence. Through such movements, the nationalists tried to forge a national unity. But as we have seen, diverse groups and classes participated in these movements with varied aspirations and expectations. As their grievances were wide-ranging, freedom from colonial rule also meant different things to different people. The Congress continuously attempted to resolve differences and ensure that the demands of one group did not alienate another. This is precisely why the unity within the movement often broke down. The high points of Congress activity and nationalist unity were followed by phases of disunity and inner conflict between groups. In other words, what was emerging was a nation with many voices wanting freedom from colonial rule. Quit India Movement The failure of the Crips mission and the effects of World War II created widespread discontentment in India. This led Gandhiji to launch a movement calling for complete withdrawal of British from India. The Congress Working Committee, in its meeting in Vardha on 14th July 1942, passed the historic Quit India Movement resolution demanding the immediate transfer of power to Indians and quit India. On 8th August 1942, in Bombay, the All India Congress Co Committee endorsed the resolution which called for a non-violent mass struggle on the widest possible scale throughout the country. It was on this occasion that Gandhiji delivered the famous do or die speech. The call for quit India almost brought the state machinery to a standstill in large parts of country as people voluntarily threw themselves into the thick of the movement. People observed hartals and demonstrations and processions were accompanied by national songs and slogans. The movement was truly a mass movement which brought into its ambit thousands of ordinary people, namely students, workers and peasants. It also saw the active participation of leaders, namely Jay Prakash Narayan, Aruna Asaf Ali and Ram Manohar Lohia and many women such as Matangini Hazra in Bengal, Kanaklata Barua in Assam and Rama Devi in Odisha. The British responded with much force, yet it took more than a year to suppress the movement. I hope you like the audio. Thank you.